Good morning. I'd like to uh, welcome you here to the U.S. Institute of Peace. Um, this is a special meeting of our Haiti Working Group. Um, my name is Bob Perito. I'm the director of the Haiti Program here at USIP. Uh, we have a very special guest this morning, the former Prime Minister of Haiti, uh, Michel Pierre-Louis, uh, who I will introduce in a moment. We also want to welcome those viewing this event online. Uh, we invite you who are watching to participate in the online chat. Uh, we also would welcome your questions, and we will introduce those later in the program. Today, the government of Haiti faces three major challenges. First, it must provide leadership for the removal of rubble, the reconstruction of municipal areas around Port-au-Prince, and the resettlement of more than a million internally displaced people. At the same time, it must organize and conduct national elections for the presidency and the parliament at the end of November. And it must then manage the transition to a new government. And third, it must deal with unexpected developments, such as the cholera epidemic that is threatening to spread throughout the country. Meeting even one of these challenges would test any government. Meeting all three of them at the same time will require considerable assistance from the international community. In the past, the Haitian government was dictatorial and predatory, but today it is simply not present in many areas in the country. The parliament has completed its term and has left office. The president is in the final months of his term. Haiti's civil service was devastated by the earthquake. All but one government ministry building was destroyed. Some 16,000 civil servants, or about 20% of the country's <coughs> total public administrative force, were lost. Ironically, after going about the job of creating the Republic of NGOs over the last couple of decades, the international community has learned its lesson and has put the government of Haiti in the lead for reconstruction and future development. This is the first principle of U.S. policy for Haiti's recovery, as we learned a few weeks ago when the State Department representative spoke from this podium. Unfortunately, the government of Haiti may not be able to play that role. Even if the elections go off without problems, it will be next spring before the government of Haiti, including both the presidency, the parliament, and all appointees are in place and able to provide leadership. So in these trying times, how will the government of Haiti deal with this situation of multiple emergencies? And what help can the international community most usefully provide? Our guest speaker this morning is someone well qualified to answer that question. Michel Pierre-Louis became Prime Minister of Haiti in September 2008 during a month when four named storms, Faye, Gustave, Hannah, and Ike, slammed into Haiti with devastating force, killing more than 800 people and causing more than a billion dollars in damage. As Prime Minister, she guided the recovery process and managed the international response, was culminated in a April 2009 donors pledging conference at the Inter-American Development Bank where Bob and I sat in the audience and watched her lead the Haitian delegation. You have um, Michelle Pierre-Louis' bio, so I will limit my introduction, but I will say that she has had a remarkable career of dedicated service to her country in many areas, including governance, protection of human rights, community development, health, and education. Currently, she is a resident fellow at the Institute of Politics at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. We are very honored and delighted to have her with us today. Um, I will ask her to come and speak. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much for these introductory words. Good morning, everyone. I'm very pleased to be here, and thanks to my friend Bob McGuire. Bob and I go a long way, 1980s, where... I was involved in a literacy program that was uh, financed by uh, the Inter-American Foundation where we used to work at the time. So thank you, Bob, for having invited me here this morning. Um, I'm going to talk about the situation in Haiti, and I think they have given you the handout. So I'll try to explain where we are at today and uh, what we're trying to do in this phase where the relief 
effort should end and the recovery and reconstruction phase to, should start. Bob had suggested that I, uh, that the title of my presentation is Building Back Better. But then he said, maybe it's better if we have the question mark. <laughs> is Haiti building back better? This is the plan of my presentation. You know the facts. We're going to go through that rapidly. The collapse of the government infrastructure. What decision we're taking, taking after. The government plan. The Interim Haitian Recovery Com Commission. What has been done in terms of land expropriation, but we're still waiting for a plan. We're going to see briefly the efforts that were made before the earthquake and also mm -hmm. the RAND report, which is probably the major report that was uh, elaborated after the earthquake. The need for investment today, no matter what the conditions are, but we need to create jobs. We will have a new government and I myself call for a necessary change of paradigm in Haiti. You know the facts, 300 or more dead. About two weeks ago, they were excavating some rubbles in, in Port-au-Prince, and they found 19 bodies. So the count goes on and on and on, and we don't quite know. But the government officially talks about 300,000, whereas the, the international community is still up to 250. 400, between 400 thousand and five hundred thousand orphans and uh, adoption is a real issue today um, kids are in the streets uh, and uh, there is a lot of family solidarity because even in these dire conditions the Haitian people behave admirably well so far left on their own devices as you know no national palace no ministries no court of justice no fiscal entity and so on and so forth. And I'll go rapidly through the images, which I think you probably saw, but to me, who worked in all those places just about a year ago, it's really mind-boggling to see the National Palace, Parliament, the Tax Bureau, and it was a three-story building, the Court of Justice, which was a beautiful, magnificent building, the Ministry of Justice, pile of rubbles. Ministry of Women Rights. The Ministry of Education. The Ministry of Culture. The former army headquarters that was transformed into a Ministry of Culture. Beautiful building that goes way back at the turn of the century. The Ministry of the Environment. Ministry of Social Affairs. Ministry of Public Health public works, interior, commerce. Foreign Affairs was a beautiful building that was built in, in the 1940s. Uh, and this is what remains of it. It's by the seashore and it was really a beautiful building. And the cathedral. So all the major symbols of <coughs> this country and of the state we are totally destroyed and collapsed in, what, between 36 and 42 seconds. And as, um, as was told earlier, about 40% of the workforce, the civil servants, died. And you know, the earthquake happened um, after 4 o'clock. And in Haiti, people work, civil servants work from 8 to 4. So whoever remained in the office afterwards were the directors, uh, the, the top management, and they are the ones who really died. And lots of ministers had their kids who were in school who died or their parents whose house collapsed and died. So what has been done after, right after? You know, the government was in a position where it could not even have a place to meet but the international community, right after, decided on a series of conferences, symposium, roundtable. People told me not too long ago, <laughs> including 
one minister, we are really tired of conferences. We've been to so many already in, in nine months, and we still don't know what's, what's happening because we don't have the funding. So anyway, right after the international community and the government created, worked on something which is called the PDNA, the Post-Disaster Needs Assessment. When I was in office after the earthquake, we also, uh, I'm sorry, after the hurricanes, we also had a PDNA. Um, and at the time, it was, uh, we thought that was an enormous amount of money that we needed because 15% of the GDP um, were lost in the hurricanes, and uh, now it's 40, 50 percent. And the government worked on an action plan for recovery and national development that was presented in the March 31st uh, um, conferences at the UN. Um, there is a commission which is called the, in French, la Commission interaméricaine, pardon, <laughs> la Commission interministérielle pour l'aménagement du territoire the Interministerial Commission for Territorial Management, SIAT. And the SIAT, actually I created the SIAT when I was Prime Minister because Haiti's territory is not managed. We've never decided on which land is for agriculture, which land is for housing. If there are infrastructures, port, airports that need to be built within the country where where to, so I created the SIAT with the idea that after the hurricanes, it was important to think rebuilding already and to think of territorial management. And SIAT has, has uh, elaborated a very interesting document which is called Haiti Tomorrow, but nobody has taken that into account. And if those of you are interested, I can send it to you. It's really, to me, the best, one of the best documents that was uh, elaborated after the earthquake in terms of planning, urban planning, territorial planning. The IMF, after the earthquake, because when, uh, when I left office in November, um, the three-year accord that we had with the IMF had expired. The extended credit facility so was renewed in April of this year with the IMF, and it's an important document because the IMF usually uh, sets the tone other donors look at the IMF to see where they, where they should position themselves. And the president had created several presidential commission. Uh, their reports were due, so the education submitted their report after the earthquake, the IT, the technology, the competitiveness, which was the private sector, investment and in, um, enterprises, the constitution, the justice and security, which I think this one is kind of problematic still. The private sector made several propositions, and the RAND Corporation, as I said, published a close to 200-page uh, document recently called Building a More Resi Resilient Haitian State. And of course, there is still uh, in vigor the document strategy for re poverty reduction. In French, it's the SNCRP. So there are lots of documents. Nobody has really made a thorough assessment of those documents to see, all right, this is, uh, this is where we should concentrate our efforts. This is, where, uh, this is what comes f from all those documents and that could create a real plan. And then there was the response of the international community and the NGOs. As you know, billions of dollars were raised. I was in Great Britain last week. And I was myself surprised to hear that citizens in Great Britain raised over 100 million sterling pounds for Haiti. But nobody really knows what, what, what happened to those funds. They've, they've gone to several NGOs. They've gone to credible NGOs. Some of them are still in the bank. Some of those funds are still in the bank, not even delivered because they're still waiting to see what to do with. But the response was incredible. I even saw on TV uh, elephants in Thailand, and Haiti has practically no relationship with Thailand, that had basket, flowered black basket on their trumps collecting funds for Haiti. So there's been a lot and a lot of money, and again, we in Haiti are extremely grateful to the international community to the US, Canadian, British citizens for their response. 
because at the time, even my, my, own, my own house collapsed. So I spent about a month sleeping in the street right in front of the house. So, and, and it was a very moving experience to see all those people sleeping in the streets with no food, no water, no clothes, and at the time there were not even tents. Fortunately, it was not the rainy season yet, but I was fortunate enough to go live someplace, but most of the people don't have that capacity to rent a new place, to go live somewhere. So they created those tent cities that you see everywhere, and the, the, on the health side also, the response was very important. Lots of hospitals, Israeli, um, Argentine, Brazilian, France, the U.S. came with the U.S. Comfort, which is the, this big ship where all the operations that could not be done in the hospitals there, the, the patients were transported on the ship. So a lot of money. I remember in April, I met with the U.S. ambassador in Haiti, and that was, what, uh, three months after the earthquake? And he said that the U.S. already spent a billion dollars in Haiti. And he said, you're not going to see where that money goes because it's, it, we have to take care of the ship which is in the harbor <coughs> to pay for oil, to pay for all the people who came. You know, there were over 200 doctors, nurses, and, and head nurses, American in, in the country. So, they, 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 of course, the cost for all those uh, expenditures uh, were, were, were very high, but you don't quite see how we is involved in the reconstruction. But there, then we went, we went into temporary shelters, temporary schools. IDB gave uh, funding to the FIES. FIES is the Fonds d'Assistance Économique et Sociale, uh, the, the entity that was created at the time of the, of the structural adjustment programs. And uh, they were able to create temporary schools in most of, because 65% of the schools in Port-au-Prince were destroyed, and 95% of the universities. I used to teach at the university, actually I'm going back. I know how bad it is for our universities and our students. Now, the action plan of the government, um, re the rebuilding effort should go in four major areas. So this action plan document has a lot of good intentions. Um, you know, good uh, way of looking at things. So there was the territorial, territorial, economic, social, institutional uh, efforts of rebuilding because the president said that Haiti should, in 30 years, Haiti should be an emerging um, democracy. So lots of good intention, but at the same time, we're still waiting for the plan, the operational plan. They created the Interim Haitian Recovery Commission, which is headed by the actual Prime Minister and President Clinton. And the, the, the IHRC is just a, an approval entity. So on the left-hand side, you have l'agence for la reconstruction d'Haïti, which is the donor agency, which is headed by the World Bank now, I think, with the UN and IDB, they have a committee, and other, attend other sectors can come and present their propositions. So they are the donors on the, the, two, the two blocks on the, on the left-hand side. Now, the H IHRC approves projects. So they have a board, um, you know how it's, con it's been constituted with all the donors, but also representative of Haiti, even though in Haiti there was a lot of discussion on how those representatives were nominated. I was discussing with some people in the diaspora while I was in Harvard, and they said, we've heard that there is a representative of the diaspora, but we don't know who elected him, how, how is this person sitting in, in that board. So anyway, the, the IHRC, the Interim Commission, receive projects from everyone. Even my foundation, we submitted projects. Everyone submits projects, but there is no coherence yet. They just receive projects and, and, and approve, uh, and um, I think most of the projects have been approved. There are different sectors. 
Um, uh, the sector on housing, for instance, is uh, headed by Ms. Uh, Priscilla Phelps, who is a World Bank um, official. And uh, there is a young Haitian-American doctor from Harvard University who had the health sector. And they're supposed to just approve projects. No funding goes to the interim commission. So either the private sector, the NGOs, or any other stakeholder has a project that is funded, submits it for approval, or even if it's not funded, the, the commission try to see if they can direct you to the agency for the funding. And of course, the implementation sector or the public sector, all the ministries, uh, the NGOs, and the private sector. It's kind of complex so far. They have approved over 200 projects, but I, I don't think one third of those projects already have funding. So in, in a sense, um, it's just the approval which is there. Now, the government also has expropriated land. This is on the north, uh, no, this is the bay, the black spot is the bay. So it's going to north, to the north, and all this part has been expropriated. But there is a big issue of land tenure. So we don't quite uh, know what the government plans to do there. And all the owners of those land, because there, are, there is private land there also, uh, are in the process of seeing if they would be compensated for their land because once the government declare uh, there is a decree of expropriation, the land becomes state land. But the government has the obligation by law to compensate the owners of the land as long as they can produce their titles. And it's a big, big issue. There is another expropriation that went very recently this is the historical quarter of Port-au-Prince. And there also, there, there's a lot of discussion with the owners because most of the, of the properties there, this is really the historical part of Port-au-Prince, which was created by the French during French colonial times, and then expanded in, uh, through, through the century when we became independent. So this is the part that the government has declared state property uh, with the idea of having a reconstruction project for the government, because this includes the National Palace and all the ministries that I showed earlier, but also the port and, um, and all um, the freight forwarders. And, uh, so it's, it's not clear yet what project is going to come out of this. Now, everyone is asking, where is the operational plan? In other words, as I said, there are lots of good intentions. Projects have been approved, but there is a lack of funding and there is a lack of coherence. There, is a, there has been two degree of land expropriation, but we don't see the urban planning and reconstruction scheme. There is an agency for reconstruction. We don't know the disbursement mechanism. And there is certainly a lack of communication because there is a feeling that the Haitian people, one of the major stakeholders through his civil society organization, is being left out of the, pro of the process. And I can tell you, because I'm pretty much involved in a lot of civil society and grassroots organization, and the complaint is constant, we are not part of what is happening to our country and to our city. But at the same time, Let's go backward. The, um, the, even this year, you know, foreign foreign affairs and the 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 Foundation for Peace they publish every year a failed state index. And in the one published this year, we still we we made some progress in spite of the earthquake because we were eight, and for the first time we went on top, but for the bad reasons. So Haiti ranks. 11 among 177 countries listed among the most fragile states. But as you know, in 2009, when I was prime minister, Professor Collier, who is a, an economics professor at Oxford University in Great Britain, uh, has had challenged the failed state um, uh, um, in this with regard to Haiti. <coughs> and this is what Collier said, that our fundamentals are not as bad as those 
that are usually categorized in the f fragile state uh, condition. We are not part of the troubled region. Our neighbors are peaceful. We don't have uh, ethnic problems or deep ideological cleavage. We don't have a military. Um, and we have a huge proximate diaspora, all the Haitians abroad, which is a reservoir of skills, um, provider of remittances. The amount of remittances is larger than for all foreign assistance to Haiti. So Haitian working abroad make a lot of sacrifice to send money home. The problem is that this money is not structured, and it's used a lot in consumptions. And since we import most of our goods, the money comes back right here, <laughs> considering that we import mostly from the U.S. I have a plan for, for uh, the, the diaspora fund. Maybe we can talk about that. I had it when I was prime minister. I didn't have the time to implement it. But it could be a very imp interesting um, outlet. Now, of course, uh, Professor Collier thought of the HOPE legislation that was passed here, uh, which uh, allows garment <coughs> products to come here duty-free and quota-free uh, for the next, at the time it was nine years, now it's ten years, but I think it's, it's been extended. The Congress has, U.S. Congress has voted a new one that extends it and opens the, the garment um, um, industry to new projects. Um, these two things that Professor Collier said about the hope and MINUSTA, of course, a lot of discussion about that. People don't agree necessarily. Some people believe that um, the economy cannot be based on assembly industry, which is true in a way because it does not contribute to wealth. But at the same time, we have a large unemployed and unskilled labor. So if we want to create jobs and get advantage of this hope legislation, it's good. But we have to have a vision in our country that this cannot be the answer. We have to invest in ed education. We have to have credit facilities. We have to create SMEs. We have to have other economic devices in the country. The, the economy cannot be based on just job creation in the, with regard to the hope legislation. And as for MINUSTA, you know, the head of Minister, Minister lost about 100 people in the earthquake, but even before, there was a lot of discussion about the use of Minister in Haiti, and we can debate on that. Now, a few indicators. Now, of course, I chose the one in 2009 because I was there, and they look better. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's not to talk about me. It's to show that I, I was prime minister during 14 months after four hurricanes. And we were able to change all the figures. Go on any, any data, even CIA, you will see the improvements that was done in 2009 because we took our job seriously and decided that something had to be done for the country. It did not change much because 14 months is not a long time. But still, we were able to increase the GDP. We were, we were the only country in the, in the Caribbean to have a real growth rate in 2009, considering the financial crisis. Whereas in 2008, it was 0 0.8. 2009, we were able to raise it to 2.9. Of course, this had no incidence on the GDP per capita, because again, there is a growth issue. <coughs> Budget was also increased in, in 2008. The inflation rate decreased tremendously. Now, the, the GDP composition shows the, the larger part of agriculture, but if you look at the labor force, you see that 66% are officially mostly informal. Still work in agriculture gives you an idea of the poor productivity in that sector, which means that we cannot leave, let the patient peasant continue to plow his land with a, a colonial hope that dates since colonial time, 200, 400 years old. So something has to be done towards that population that has carried 
the, the, the economy of the country on its shoulder. And if you look at the IMF figures for the past 25 years, not even 1% of all the funds given to Haiti went as investment to agriculture. So it's a, it's a real issue that has to be addressed. So even in export and imports, we made progress. We increase export, we decrease imports. And again, I, re I refer to the RAIN Corporation because there was the collier before the earthquake, there is the RAIN after the earthquake. And I found it a very interesting uh, report, very, very thorough, considering all the sectors. There might be issues that need discussion with all the stakeholders, but they say very important things um, about building back better. Um, the Haitian state should overcome its weaknesses in areas of human resources, education, organization. Um, I, I heard a quote from President Clinton, but again, I never know if it's true or not. It seems that in, in, uh, he's in traveling in Asia, and he said that Haiti lacks systems. There are no systems in Haiti. So it's very important in terms of organization, procedures, and policies to revamp the country if we continue to have no, no culture, no, no, no systemic culture. <laughs> and the real report said something which to me is extremely important. Haiti's poverty, like its governmental weakness, is a product of its political culture. <laughs> I'm well, well placed to know what it means. Any effort to build a stronger, more resilient Haiti, one that is less dependent on external help, will depend on changing that culture. I was involved with the World Bank. <coughs> Every year, the World Bank publishes uh, a report which is called Doing Business. And Haiti is really at the bottom of doing business because it's so hard. Here is a country where we need investment and job creation, but it is so hard to create an enterprise in Haiti. So doing business while I was prime minister, we dis discussed a lot about that, short-term short reforms. First, elimination of the obligation to legalize the accounting book. Do you know that in Haiti, the accounting book have to be filled out by hand? They don't accept um, digitalized or computerized form. You cannot have a printout to send to the um, fiscal entity for audit. It has to be handwritten. And now, bef when you create an enterprise, you have to take your accounting books, go to the court of justice, and on every page, they put a seal, page by page, sometimes 200 pages, and he signs on the seal. So can you imagine? And until today, it's the law. So this was extremely difficult for me to eliminate that process because it has to be changed by law. <clears throat> the second, acceptance of type legal documents from the public notary rather than handwritten. <clears throat> when you want to create an enterprise in Haiti, you go to a public notary by obligation, and you have these 19th century papers, you know, that are, that also I could not change because it's a law. <clears throat> Elimination of the prime minister and president's signature on, corporation, on new corporation and enterprise, that we eliminated. We were, the president and I agreed that there was, no, there was no use. It's a procedure that existed under Duvalier. Duvalier wanted to control who is creating an enterprise or corporation in Haiti. But it was not a law. So the president and I agreed and now it goes directly to the register in the Ministry of Commerce. <coughs> New commercial laws on <coughs> commercial enterprise. There is a mandatory minimum capital, and most corporations today are saying it's not necessary. They don't do it in other countries. Make the public notary documentation optional, because now it's mandatory. Provide standard documentation and forms. You know, there are so many steps that you go to the Ministry of Commerce, they give you a form. You go to the fiscal entity, they give you a form. And sometimes people get discouraged just by the, 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 this very bureaucratic and inefficient steps that need to be taken. 
So we place the publication in the official journal. There is an official journal, and all new enterprise have to be published there. But there is tax, you know, it's piled at the, at the journal. So it may take six months before your enterprise, even though you have all your papers, but it's not published yet. So very often it's, there is a bribe to be paid so that they remove yours on the bottom, they put it on the top. So they say it's not necessary. It could be just published online in the Ministries of Commerce Register. I think they have started. They have started because I looked at it and I saw that there are new publications. Install a booth at the Ministry of Commerce because you had to go back and forth from one minister to the other. That I did also while I was Prime Minister. And we are in the process, we were in the process of reassessing the use of what they call a professional identity card. Same thing with the transborder commerce, there are lots of bottlenecks, so they propose a lot of improvement to see if um, the enterprise can import and export uh, much easier. And the new corporate laws, there are lots of conflict of interest in Haiti, in, Haiti, in, the, in the corporation and enterprises issue corporate governance procedures, the issue of right and obligation of the shareholders, particularly vis-à-vis -vis the, the authorities and the audits. So these are recommendations that were made last year at this time, actually, in, in, in October, September, and we were in the process of trying to see how to implement them when the earthquake arrived. So in 2011, we're going to have a new government. The campaign is on, 19 candidates for the presidency. There are over 60 candidates for 12 Senate seats, over 500 for 100 lower house seats, and local government, which is going to come after. We probably will have 10,000 um, candidates for the local government. And me, I insist on something which I did talk about when I was Prime Minister after the earthquake, you know. We are in a situation now where all major leaders, stakeholders in the country need to have an effort of transcendence. You know, I'll give you an anecdote and I'll close right after. Uh, I went to South Africa in 1996. I was head of the foundation that I created in 1995. I was invited by by, with the support of the Soros Foundation, and I was invited by the foundation in, in South Africa. And when I arrived, President Mandela was in power, and he, while I was there, he invited the former wife, the wives of the former prime minister, the white prime minister, to have breakfast at his uh, palace. And at, that was a time of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, so there were TVs and a lot of mobilization in the, in the country. And there was a big uproar in the, in the townships about that. How can you do that, you know? Uh, uh, and and, and the, the, the black community, mostly the young, were extremely upset about that. But he explained. He said, you know, they were probably the closest advisors to their husbands. And I need to talk to them to understand and see what was this all about, but the uproar continued. So they all came to have breakfast except for Mrs. Bota. So he called her and he said, I have invited you, you did not come. So me, I'm coming to your house. Yeah. And there was even more uproar, you know, people, wow. But anyway, he did go under closed doors. And when he came out, he made a speech about transcendence, about the obligation to transcend the past if we want to build the future. You know, I'm telling you that I've goose pimple because I remember that speech, and it's probably something that had such an impact on me that it always crossed my mind. It always comes back to my mind with regard to Haiti. If we continue with our sterile divisions, if we, especially the so-called elite in this country, and when I say elite, I just not talk about the private sector only. I talk about the university elite, the, the peasant elite, the, you know, all those leaders. If we cannot have an effort of transcendence and continue to fight for power, what power, as a matter of fact, 
I think re reconstruction is going to be extremely difficult. And that's what I call a necessary paradigm shift. To build back better, we need to depart from a political culture which is too much based on nepotism. You know, when I was prime minister, every day I had mostly parliament members, as a matter of fact, in my office with piles of curriculum vitae of their sisters, their brothers, their mistress, their <laughs> father, their mother, you know, can you hire that person for me, Prime Minister? You know, it's very important for me because they think, they think that I have such a big job that I have to take care of the whole family. And it's like that constantly. And it's not just me, it's all the ministers. And usually, it's very tricky because usually the state is the larger employer in Haiti. So nepotism, having your family, you know, in, in, your, in, in, in your office or pushing for your family members to be hired by a friend minister is common. So clientelism is, is there constantly. You know, you have to give money to this. And, and, and so it creates also an ineffective bureaucratic administration and very often when the opposition starts, the government creates its own tonton makout or mi mili militia. So we have to move from that to a mentality of public service, institution building, and fight corruption. From a rent-seeking economy based on lack of vision, venality very often, and a very elitist posture, dependency deals, an archaic legal system to an understanding of the role of human capital, education, skilled labor, the new legal environment, risk-taking invest investment, and wealth creation. From social exclusion, there is a population which has been historically marginalized. That's enough. We, and they want to participate. The Haitian people want to be enfranchised. So let's stop that exclusion business and fight against poverty. Develop a middle class. We are in a constant rapport, elite masses, because they say that the, middle, the Haitian middle class is in the diaspora. Well, the middle class has to be in Haiti. And it has to go, it has to, it means investing in education, investment in our human capital, creating SMEs, giving access to credit. Because the country has a lot of assets. There are opportunities. If only we manage what we have as assets in culture, in history, we can make a big, big change. And of course, from cynicism to ethics. Pride and self-esteem, I think we are very dignified people. Public engagement, and a willingness to debate and to communicate. There is such a lack of communication. So this is what I had for you today. Merci en pile. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a wonderful speech and a great uh, start to our morning. Um, I'd now like to introduce our second speaker. Um, as they say very often, this is someone who needs no introduction. Bob McGuire is the chair of the Haiti Working Group here at USIP. Normally he sits where I sit, but we thought we'd take advantage of this unique opportunity this morning to give Bob the opportunity to make a formal presentation. Bob is also an associate professor of international affairs at Trinity Washington University and probably one of the most informed people in, in the United States on Haiti. Um, as you heard from the Prime Minister, um, she and Bob are old friends. We kind of thought about this um, program this morning as a dialogue in which she would begin, Bob would follow, and then we'd open the um, opportunity for you all in the audience to join in and, and to those online. So I'll introduce Bob McGuire. Thank you. Um, you shouldn't applaud before I speak. Uh, <laughs> you might not want to afterward. Um, 
It's been a pleasure to hear Michelle this morning, um, and um, I knew we would have something special when we invited her here. And when I posed the question to her to answer, um, I deliberately said it should be, is Haiti building back better, not Port-au-Prince? Um, as many of you who have been to Haiti know, um, or at least when the first time you go to Haiti you're often told mm. this, that there are actually two Hades. Um, there's the Republic of Haiti and there's the Republic of Port-au-Prince. And even though the earthquake struck in the vicinity of Port-au-Prince, I think the idea of building back better pertains to all of Haiti. And the need to build Haiti back better was an issue even before the earthquake. Um, and I'll get into that momentarily. After the earthquake struck, and I sat here in Washington, having left Haiti two days before the earthquake, and tried to make sense of it, I, I thought that, well, you know, sometimes you might try to see a dark lining and a, a silver lining in a very dark cloud. And I thought, well, you know, maybe this earthquake does provide an opportunity to address issues and problems and imbalances within the country and with the relationships externally to Haiti that have been holding back Haiti's development. And I think Michelle has touched on many of them in her presentation, uh, particularly this last segment where she talks about these necessary paradigm shifts um, and this whole concept of transcendence, which I think is extremely important. <coughs> Um, it strikes me that um, one of the ironies of Haiti, a country with a proud history that should be celebrated, is that so many of its leaders have um, kind of um, betrayed that history because when they get in leadership positions, and I think it's important that she stress that it's not just political leaders or elites, it's leaders at all segments of the society, that when leaders get in positions, their tendency is to look for what can this do for me and not how can I use this to improve the people and the nation. So I think that transcendence idea is one thing that we definitely should take away from this meeting um, and think about it and see how we might be able to enact it. Um, my <clears throat> assessment immediately after the quake pointed to a number of paradigm shifts, those that, that Michelle mentioned and maybe a few others. Um, I thought about that demographic imbalance of Haiti, where um, the country had been evolving from one that was essentially an agrarian society with about 80 percent of the population traditionally living in rural settings and a much smaller percentage in cities, and how that had shifted over time and, and very rapidly. Um, in, the, in the late 1970s, there was that 80-20 demographics split um, at the time of the earthquake, most uh, analysts said it was like 55 percent rural and 45 percent urban, with the urban population continuing to grow. So I thought, well, maybe this is an imbalance that, that can be changed somehow after the um, earthquake. And, and I reflected on, well, why is this imbalance grown as it has? And, and you have to go back to this whole concept of re the Republic of Port-au-Prince where um, you know, education, health, and other services were principally available only there. And for poor people outside of that city, the city held the promise of opportunity, which for most of them turned out to be a mirage, in fact, with, with little opportunity once they got into the city, with people ending up piling upon themselves in along vulnerable coastal areas, in dry riverbeds, <coughs> on uh, in stable hillsides and in ravines. And we saw the result of that um, both with the earthquake and previously and since then whenever there's a heavy rain. Just two weeks ago, I think there was a heavy rainfall in Port-au-Prince, and 12 people died. Um, and these were people who are in, in very vulnerable areas even before the earthquake. Um, so, you know, I thought maybe there's an opportunity here to strengthen that agrarian society. And, and I've had some people criticize me when I talk about this, and they say, well, you think the peasants should stay peasants? You know, and, and, and I say, of course, no, I don't think so. I mean, my grandfather was a peasant. I'm glad I'm not a peasant. Um, but I talk about an agrarian society, and I often think about uh, a man I know who was a skilled furniture maker 
in, in the area of Haiti that's called Dene. And when I first met him, he had a workshop in this rural village that employed 20 people, and they made furniture. And when I met him again, the last time I met him, which was five or six years ago, he employed four people, and the only thing they made was coffins, because that was the only thing that people could afford. So invest in that agrarian society. Invest in those small and medium enterprises that are in the agrarian area, not just to grow food, not just peasant farmers, but to service a, an agrarian economy. And I think this is really important. Um, and, and going back to Michelle's comments on the, um, the HOPE Act and, and the assembly jobs, um, as I think I may have said even here before, um, the whole conundrum of the assembly sector is, is for me, summed up in the title of a, of a poem that was writ written by Richard and Mimi Farina, a couple of hip po beat poets from San Francisco a long time ago. I'm giving away my generation. But the title of the poem was, I've been down so long it looks like up to me. And, and this is the way I perceive the assembly jobs. You know, it, it is something that's required and people benefit from it. But I strike, I go back to something that, that Hillary Clinton said at the uh, donors conference that Michelle, um, uh, I guess you managed it or organized it, presided over it in April of 2009 when Hillary Clinton remarked that um, there is so much talent in Haiti and the real challenge for Haiti's future development is somehow to find ways of twinning talent with opportunity. And when we talk about Haiti's middle class being outside the country, um, I think part of the reason for that is that it is only outside of Haiti that Haitians can twin their talents with opportunity. And somehow that has to change and has to happen in Haiti. Um, and I also thought that perhaps a part of that silver lining could be that we could continue to evolve, see the Haitian state evolve. Um, when I first started working in Haiti in the 70s, um, the common description of the Haitian state was the predatory state, the state that preyed on people. And many academics use this phrase in their books and in their articles. And I think what we've seen essentially in the transitional period after the collapse of the Duvalier dictatorship <clears throat> is an evolution to now, when I think Michelle mentioned this herself, where the state is absent. The state is virtually absent. It has been uh, cannibalized over time. Um, it hasn't received resources. Um, state officials find themselves drawn to work in international organizations and NGOs that pay them regularly and well might even offer the promise of a green card, and the state is robbed of its personnel. Um, Francois Pierre-Louis spoke here last year and talked about the demoralization of the state. Um, and, and somehow, um, and I think this is one of the positive things in the aftermath of the earthquake, at least in, on the rhetoric side, is that um, there's a recognition that the state needs to be attended to. The Haitian state is an important actor. It has to play a role. Its institutions have to be strengthened. It has to be able to regulate. It has to be able to lead. And at least in the rhetoric that we're hearing now, that is very, very clear. And hopefully we will see that um, more and more become beyond rhetoric and into s strong action. In, in a nutshell, much of, of, of what I thought could occur to help Haiti build back better is predicated upon overcoming one fundamental imbalance in Haiti. And it's what I call the kind of citoyen andeo imbalance, dichotomy. Um, you know, in Haiti it used to be, um, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, that there were two kinds of birth certificates. Um, when you were born, depending on your, your, your status in life or your stature, um, you, you were either determined to be a peasant or a citizen. And, and it was a kind of a, a ritualized um, apartheid in a sense. Uh, well, that has changed. I believe now there's only one birth certificate. You're born as a human being, not as a peasant or a citizen. But you have this kind of cultural, economic, political, and even geographical imbalance and dichotomy in Haiti that really needs to be overcome. And this needs to be transcended. 
So it's this, you know, I live in the city, I'm a citizen, you live in the countryside, and you're a peasant. Um, that's something that really um, I hope that this earthquake's greatest silver lining will be enabling Haitians to overcome that dichotomy. Um, in 1987, when I traveled to uh, Haiti shortly after the collapse of the Dubai dictatorship, I learned a phrase. Um, someone um, explained it to me. The phrase was, Port-au-Prince on toujours mangé des révolutions. Port-au-Prince has always eaten the revolutions. And, and I was trying to figure it out. And it was explained to me that, you know, when there's opportunities for change in Haiti, um, the status quo comes out of Port-au-Prince and change really doesn't occur. And, and I've been thinking of that phrase for the past mm. couple of months, um, although the, certainly an earthquake is not a revolution, but this earthquake has provided opportunities. And, and I'm now thinking that Port-au-Prince is eating the opportunities. Um, now, <clears throat> I'm, I'm not going to say there isn't a need to tend to Port-au-Prince and all of the horror stories we hear about shelter and abuse of people in the camps and so on. I mean, this is a very serious need. But it seems to me that Port-au-Prince is once again eclipsing the rest of Haiti. Um, for me, after the quake, one of the key barometers would be to follow what would happen to the roughly 700,000 people who left Port-au-Prince after the quake and went outside somewhere in the rural areas. This was a kind of a, a de facto decentralization or a deconcentration in the country. And I thought, you know, wouldn't it be terrific to kind of use this as an opportunity to support these displaced people so that they can contribute outside of Port-au-Prince to build a better Haiti, to create jobs, to rehabilitate the countryside, to improve services around them where they went, to engage in public works, and to do this with really a sense of urgency and some resolute decision-making. Um, some of you who have followed my thinking on this, you know, I've been talking a lot about this whole idea of a civic service corps to mobilize youth, to do a kind of a FDR type of of public works administration to rebuild the country, to engage disenfranchised youth. But this takes, you know, a sense of urgency and resolute decision making. And I don't think we've really seen that after the quake. Um, so much of these opportunities, I think, are being um, frittered away because this has not happened. Um, I've been receiving a lot of anecdotal reports, including from conversations with your successor as prime minister of the return to Port-au-Prince of many of those who have left and bringing people with them into the ravaged city because this is where they can get some attention. This is where they can get some treatment, some water. Um, and there's not much happening in the countryside. In fact, um, in the recent cholera epidemic, um, I noted something in a piece from the, in the New York Times that is just two, two short paragraphs to, to read to you. But, but this kind of indicates that kind of ne continuing neglect of Haiti and emphasis on Port-au-Prince, where Andrew Marks, a spokesman for Partners in Health, a non-governmental organization that works closely with the Ministry of Health in rural areas, said that it had been warning of such a calamity away from the capital, but that authorities had focused disease prevention mostly on Port-au-Prince. He said, we tried to make the case not to focus exclusively on Port-au-Prince, noting that considerable effort has been made to provide clean water in the capital, but the rural areas remain lacking. And that phrase, rural areas remain lacking, um, it's a tragic phrase. I think it's something that is helping me to see that maybe that silver lining in that cloud was not quite what I had hoped it would be. This, to me, simply doesn't sound a whole lot like building back better. Now, I want to modulate that a little bit by saying that um, the action plan and, and maybe some of the other plans, including the, the uh, plan that Michelle referred to that I hadn't seen, the Haiti Tomorrow, um, there's a lot of emphasis on decentralization. There's emphasis on uh, growth poles and corridors. And as we heard from Megan Curtis um, earlier this month, that the U.S. is focusing a lot on, um, on uh, helping to support the kind of the territorial and economic decentralization 
that are reconstruction priorities of the government. Um, and we realize that these things are not going to happen quickly. Um, this is like, you know, that proverbial aircraft carrier that can't turn around on the dime because Port-au-Prince has dominated so much Haiti's life in recent decades. But, you know, um, one of the things that I've heard repeatedly in Haiti, particularly um, since 1986, this analogy to um, hearing about Haiti's window of opportunity, and, you know, it's the analogy, it's open, it's closing, it's small, it's large, and so on. I mean, it's used all the time. And, and um, you know, you hear it today. I mean, there's a window of opportunity. Um, in a sense, I, I wish that window was not kind of a Western window, but more like a, a window in a Haitian tikai, where it was just one big shutter that you could fling open and it would stay open. But I don't know how long the window's going to stay open this time. Uh, you know, there's that always that kind of ogres, ogre ogre um, uh, expression of Haiti fatigue that is there. Um, we just don't know. But I, I would just conclude because I know a lot of you have comments, and, and I'd like to have the opportunity to have Michelle address them. Mm. But um, I just feel that the time to build Haiti back better, um, from what I can see, it's beginning to slip away. Thank you. Thanks very much, Bob. We'd now like to open uh, our discussion to include those of you in the room and those of you online. Um, I have to ask that anyone who wants to make a who wants to uh, offer a question, please come to the microphones on either side of the room so everyone can hear you and so we can capture your uh, your questions. Uh, when you when you do uh, ask a question, please identify yourself by name and uh, and organization. Um, so while people are making their way to the microphones, um, I want to comment that. Um, in the current issue of Foreign Affairs, Secretary Clinton has uh, an article in which he previews the uh, QDDR, which will come out and lay out the, uh, the policies for and the restructuring of the, of the Department of State and USAID. But in that uh, article, she talks about innovative programs, and one of the um, programs that she calls attention to is the use of cell phone <laughs> technology in Haiti to direct, to direct rescue operations. Um, USIP contributed to one of the uh, most effective programs during this period. Uh, there is a new USIP publication out on the table with the uh, catchy title, Crowdsourcing Crisis Information Disaster Affected Haiti. But this is a, a very interesting report, and I would encourage you to uh, read it. I'll give you the first copy. Okay. Okay. okay, we have a number of people uh, in line. I would ask that, that you uh, keep your questions a bit short um, so that we can get everybody in. And um, I'd like to do one thing. I'd like to take two questions at a time. Um, so the first two questioners will start on that side and go here, and then we'll stop and let the Prime Minister or Bob respond to your questions. Please. Thank you. Sharice S.P. Glassman with Catholic Relief Services. Um, Madam Prime Minister, you talk about um, land tenure as uh, in your presentation, and President Bill Clinton did say this was one of the most problematic areas that we have to deal with. And you spoke about land uh, titlement, and we know during the earthquake that the, um, some of the land titles were lost in the quake, and you said that they have to present that to the government in order to um, identify uh, land. Can you please just elaborate or ex expand upon that? Because if they can't identify the land titlements, how can um, we provide land for uh, those people, those vulnerable people that need shelter. Thank you. Yeah, I got here late, so I don't know whether this was covered, and I apologize if it has been, but uh, do you think it would help in rebuilding Haiti to restore the duly elected president of Haiti to his position? Okay, in, in your name and... and uh, oh, Ken Meyer Accord representing himself. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Um, do you want to start? Yes, uh, we have land titles. Um, Yes, land title is a big issue. Before the earthquake, it was already an issue. It's an issue that that's, uh, that has to do with the creation of the Haitian state per se, because in part of the country, actually the Haitian, the Haitian state is the largest landowner in the country. 
and uh, throughout history, there's been distribution of, uh, of land titles, mostly in the beginning to the former generals and uh, army officers that had fought for independence. So there is a quagmire with regard to land tenure in Haiti. However, I must say that um, when I was prime minister, with the minister of finance then, we were able to secure in the fiscal bureau the office where all copies of land titles are supposed to be. So it so happened that nothing happened to this uh, to this um, quarter, you know, we had uh, we had a contingency plan for the land titles, and anybody today, of course, there are lots of officials in the fiscal bureau who died, especially at the top level. Actually, the general director of the of the tax bureau died in the earthquake. So, but I I know there is a, there is a, a movement of trying to see if in that bureau they can find copies of uh, land titles of all those people who want compensation for their for their properties. It's a slow process because the people who are now working in this bureau <coughs> are not very familiar with all the the, the way the way these documents were classified, and nothing is, has been digitalized yet, so it's not easy. It's uh, it's not easy. I I heard even President Preval saying that um, it's going to take some time because uh, and and they don't want to move uh, too fast if this issue of uh, titles is not resolved. So. It's going to take some time, but at least I know the copies are there. Even those who lost their titles in the earthquake have the possibility of recuperating in the tax bureau. Now, about I suppose you're talking about President Aristide. Well, you know, President Preval always say, and I think he's right, that President Aristide can come back anytime he wants, that the Constitution forbids um, exiles. So... That's all I can say to that regard. You know, I I don't know if President Aristide wants to come back. I don't know if he has made the the necessary steps to recuperate his um, passport if he doesn't have one. I don't know. But the official position of the government of Haiti, and I think President Preval has said it publicly several times, is that the Constitution does not recognize exiles, so anyone who is out of the country who wants to come back has the possibility to come back. Does, does Aristide recognize the present government of Haiti? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why he would. I don't know. You see, this is, I know it's a controversy, but if we, if we are based on the constitution and the laws of the country, that's what the official position of the government is. Okay, Obey the you. constitution after he was forced out? Uh, excuse me, can we move on? We have a lot of people here. Please, you you next. Hi, yes, my name is um, my name is Rachel Leventhal. I'm with uh, Nomadic Stories and uh, spearheading a uh, a project building women's peer to peer network, mostly in the countryside, um, connecting women using their technology, radio integrated with cell phones. We're actually working with Ushahidi, the group that you mentioned, the crowdsourcing. And I just wanted to follow mm. on what you said about the spirit of transcendence. Mm -hmm. um, my experience is actually working more with women in West Africa, um, where the spirit of transcendence really happened over a 10-year period and didn't come from government or NGOs. It really came a lot from women who met in refugee camps during the war and crossed borders and began to network uh, through the Mano River Union. And, um, and, so, and so my question is really, when, when we're, we're in a room, a lot of people are representing NGOs. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm thinking also about not just a shift of people within the, the country, but mm. how do we adjust our thinking as people from the outside in terms of supporting these kind of movements that are already happening? Um, and and that's, that's my intention with what I'm trying to do. Um, but, but how do we support what's already happening rather than think in terms of imposing policy or working through government, which needs to be held accountable by people? Yeah. Um, and just in terms of Haitian culture, I'm curious about 
what you think about that and how you think that should happen uh, as quickly as possible, um, just given the circumstances Thank you. Thank and you. given how particularly women in the countryside have no voice um, no, and right. haven't been included at all in reconstruction discussion. Thank you. Thank um, you. Can we have a question over here? We'll take two at once. Okay. Uh, my name is Asuka. I work for La Rouge Pack. And my question is regarding to, to this cholera disease uh, outbreak. Because um, right now it has been like, I mean, ten, 10 days already. And I have a case, right, um, during the 90s, uh, 1994, under Clinton, we had a similar situation in Rwanda where there was a cholera disease spread. But within two days, um, Clinton sent a whole team of U.S. Army together with San Francisco Fire Department um, and heavy water purification equipment. And within t t uh, two days, we actually produced 200,000 liters of pure water per day. And it, pro it actually saved um, half a million uh, uh, people in Ru Rwanda at the time. This mobilization was very quick and it was uh, massive in terms of the support that we provided. And it was a top-down decision. And this we can do today. Um, and there's a, there's a call right now from Mr. Lyndon LaRouche to mobilize U.S. Army in that fashion very quick. But my question is, do you think it's going to happen under President Obama, who actually have been refusing to mobilize uh, massively to, to actually relocate Haitians to safe ground right after the earthquake. And there are a lot of things we can do, right? Like there was a proposal, again, from Mr. Lyndon LaRouche to mobilize in a, in, a, in a similar way as what Franklin Roosevelt did during the 30s to have massive infrastructure project in Haiti. None has been done. And my question is, well, doesn't that mean we have to actually get Obama out right now <laughs> for the sake of can not we, only Haiti, could we, uh, but also can U.S. Can we allow economy? the Prime Minister to respond to your questions? Yeah, that sure. would be really good. I think everybody okay. would like to hear her answer. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, about the women issue, that's very interesting. You see, yesterday I had a class at Harvard, and uh, my topic was the long process of emancipation of Haitian women. And um, unfortunately, you cannot tell everything in... 20 minutes, you know, 20 minutes PowerPoint. But I had an idea that I should have thought about that. It's, it's very interesting what happened in Haiti. Mm -hmm. I would say even in the past 80 years, because the women's movement started in the 30s with, at the time, educated women. But they were the ones who launched the struggle. That, were, that was later picked on. Uh, they were the ones who actually forced the, the, the presidency at the time and the constitution in the 1940s to allow for women to be elected. There was still a contradiction. Women could be elected, but women could not vote. Mm. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but in 1957, that was universal. So this long struggle that started reached out to the rural areas. Uh, it took time because under Duvalier, of course, all civil liberties were um, prohibited. But since 1986, you know, 80, April 3rd, 1986, which is now the National Day for Women's Rights, uh, women took to the streets, including organizations from the countryside. We were over 35,000 <coughs> women that demonstrated they wanted to participate in the democratic process in the country at the time. And it's interesting to see that today, the, the, even though there are different categories, you know, there are the, the feminist organization that work mostly on the legal framework. And I think it's important because they've been able to change the laws on adultery, on uh, rape, and uh, it's important. Sometimes they are attacked, like there are two you know, bourgeois or whatever, but they work on what's important also. But at the grassroots level, indeed, the, the idea of transcendence is probably much more mature there and much more pre poignant and, did you say, pre important, let's say. 
then at the government level or even the major international donors. Now, you're asking what should you do? I think you should first be informed. Mm -hmm. What's going on there? Because there are so many experiences in Haiti that are not known to the outside world, that are positive. Of course, they, they are micro. They don't reach the they, they, they don't reach a macro level but they are important they change things at the local level and very often they are spearheaded by women so it's important to find out what you you have a project which seems interesting it's important to to go find out talk to people don't come with your set ideas be open to what to the culture of the country, what people say, their own experience, and you'll be surprised to see how important change can come that way also. Yeah, interestingly, I think in most countries in the world, that the group of women who drive change are market women because That's right. they, they're illiterate. And they are the majority. They're, they're mm-hmm. business women, but they also are used to coming can, together. Can we, absolutely. Can we ask that we, can we move on? Thank you very much. I know these are each one of these are just really interesting questions. So we have a question that well, that you I, need to I cannot to. say anything about President Obama or President Clinton. All I know is that um, sometimes the conditions under which these presidents are are different, and the response in Haiti, even though the president did not send this armada of chaotic or of health care takers, uh, there's still a very important response from WHO, uh, Pan American Organization, all these major NGOs like um, Doctors Without Borders, Partners in Health, they are all there on the ground. And it's interesting to see that the number of dead is decreasing, and they've been able to contain so far the, the, the epidemics in the Artibonite region. So. It's true that when you have full capacity to respond to a disaster, it makes a big difference. But when it doesn't happen, actually it's more your role than mine. (laughs) Then see why and uh, see what could be done on your side. Thank you very much. I'll take three questions. I want to take a question from uh, those watching online from Sherry from the International Medical Angels Network. She asks, when will... Angels, I think that's it. Angels, right? Angels. She asks, when will permanent multifamily housing begin to be built? Oh, that's interesting. Actually, it was, oh, you wanted another question? Well, I was going to take three. All right, please. Okay. (coughs) Patricia Fagan, I'm here at USIP in the Jennings Randolph Fellowship Program. I'd like to ask both speakers, both the Prime Minister and Bob McGuire, to speak a bit more about the diaspora, which both of you mentioned in your addresses. (coughs) And... It's interesting, first of all, the, at the very beginning and from January on, many, many of the major donors spoke of incorporating diaspora <laughs> initiatives. I myself looked at the website of several diaspora organizations, and they responded massively and immediately and with, with great enthusiasm and, 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 great, and many contributions. But I do not have the impression that the, the diaspora organizations have been successfully incorporated. And I just call attention to one point that was raised, and that is the great the decentralization point. Many of the diaspora organizations are hometown associations that work in parts of Haiti that were not directly affected by the earthquake, but to which earthquake victims have gone and which are incapable of absorbing them. Well, the hometown associations are singularly able or prepared to at least help on that front, but from what I understand, it's been very, very difficult for them to link up with donors that might also help in, in that respect. Thank you. Thank you. And one more question. Uh, hi. Uh, good morning, and uh, Mr. Prime Minister. And uh, my name is Joseph Baptiste from NOAA. And uh, to echo uh, the question that you have about inclusion with diaspora, and thank you again for your uh, speech as far as uh, uh, want to have a paradigm shift. Uh, we always felt that, again, uh, to echo her uh, Questions: uh, The diaspora itself feels that uh, how can uh, they help on the reconstruction projects in Haiti? And we felt that we've been excluded and we didn't have a voice. And more importantly, do the government of Haiti is part of that uh, exclusion? So please uh, give more us. More importantly, uh, I didn't get the, the government of Haiti. Mm-hmm. Is it uh, 
we feel that is really not supporting mm -hmm. the fact that they were diaspora to be back in, in Haiti to, to help. So do you think that, uh, as a former prime minister, do you think that, uh, is that the case? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, please. Okay, uh, multi-family housing. Uh, until last uh, June, uh, it was not legally possible to buy an apartment, let's say, in Haiti, or to be the owner of an apartment. Um, but we passed a legislation in June 2009 where it's possible. So now it's possible to build multi-housing uh, buildings, and it's possible for people to, to, to be the owner, to, to buy it. So it's, it's an improvement, except that now we have to see what the rebuilding process is uh, in Port-au-Prince, but also in the provinces. And that leads me to the, to the hometown association that uh, was just talked about and the diaspora. Now, you know, to speak very frankly, there's b always been an issue with the diaspora. There's been those who stayed and those who left. And there is guilt on both sides. So this is the unspoken aspect of the, di the diaspora dilemma. Um, and I know, for sh I know myself, I remember when they were drafting the Constitution of 1987, a friend of mine was a lawyer and was part of the assembly that was drafting the Constitution. And when it came to this dual nationality thing, she was adamant, violently against it. You see, even though she herself mentioned how difficult it's going to be for the second gen generation, and also in terms of ownership, because in Haiti, foreigners cannot own properties. So when a, 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 a second generation Haitian American who happens to be Haitian American cannot inherit, do you say that? Inherit from their parents or their grandparents. It's a big, big problem. It's a mess. So, but it was based on this idea that those who left made it in, uh, in, uh, in the diaspora and left us under the dictatorship and uh, this guilt thing grew somehow and I don't even know if today it's, it's gone. But anyway, I know that um, Haiti has to count on its diaspora. You know, I was told as I'm in Harvard that there are more PhDs in Boston mm -hmm. than in Haiti. So how do you want us in the dire conditions we're living in not to count on the diaspora? But there has never been a framework. You see, in one of my classes, there is a Haitian American who graduated from Harvard. He told me, I went back after my graduation. I wanted to be an intern in different ministries. I went to seven ministries, telling them, you don't need to pay me. I just want to work there, learn, but also put my competencies at the service of the government. The, he was never accepted nowhere. So if we don't build a framework where we can be sure that all those Haitian diaspora, and as a matter of fact, foreigners who want to work in Haiti too, but the diaspora first, because they're connected, can be at use to the country, can at the same time bring their capacities and learn from the mutations that, that occurred in the country too, it's not going to work. You see, there is a member, as I said, of the diaspora in the interim commission. Nobody knows how this person was elected. And you write about decentralization. It's time also to see what kind of framework so that instead of having individual little donations, there is some kind of thing which is built on both sides. I have a little idea about it, but I don't know <laughs> if I should already talk about it. <laughs> but it's important, you see, it's very, very important to tap into the diaspora and know how much they can help in the rebuilding process. And uh, the last one was, uh, oh, that was uh, Mr. The, the doctor. Doctor, that, that's it, you know. We, we, we know how much you are available. 
you know how much we you want, we want. That doesn't mean everyone wants again. As I said, that guild building and that uh, re- re- repellent uh, position is still there. But again, let's have this effort of transcendence there too and know how much diaspora can help. But we have to build the framework. Otherwise, it's going to be individual. There's going to be a lot of frustration, and it's not going to work. Thanks very much. Um, Bob, do you want to? Just, just a couple of quick comments on diaspora. And, and I think this concept of the framework is extremely important. Uh, we heard Megan Curtis earlier this month talk about a program that the U.S. government will be establishing as kind of like a Fulbright-type program that would support diaspora to work uh, directly in government ministries in Haiti. But excuse me, Bob. You see, there is a problem there. Um, The OAS already has a program like that. UNDP has a program like that. But it creates problems in the ministries. Sometimes there is a very qualified engineer or or other qualified diaspora person who comes to Haiti to work for a year or, or six months or two years, but they get paid much more than the minister himself. So it creates also some frustration on the side of the government. And if we don't deal with these issues very openly also and see what can be done, it creates also a problem. Very clear. And for that reason, um, when I had follow-up discussions on this, I was thinking of this uh, conundrum. And and what crosses my mind is the kind of the, the way the Peace Corps um, mm-hmm. kind of solves this problem, mm-hmm. where people go and they live on the level of the people where they're living, and there's some sort of a readjustment allowance that's yeah. set aside for when they return. And in that regard, um, I think... My experience in working with diaspora tends to suggest that a very underutilized resource are um, Haitian American University students and recent graduates Absolutely. who could be mobilized to um, participate in, in the education system and other forms of volunteer work. Um, in infrastructure. Yeah. You know, when I was prime minister, I arrived at the time of the hurricanes, 10 bridges collapsed. And I heard the Ministry of Public Works saying, we don't have one single engineer in the country that can build a bridge. So we had to call on the French to build an eight-meter bridge, on the Canadians for a seven-meter bridge, and on USAID for a six-meter bridge. And there are piles of engineers, Haitian American or Haitian in the diaspora. Take two questions, please, on that side. Well, thank you very much for your presentations. My name is Annalise Romoser, and I work with Lutheran World Relief, and we have projects in Haiti, particularly in rural regions, focusing on agriculture and food security. In what part? Um, in the north. In the north. Uh, and I was pleased to hear, uh, Dr. McGuire, your emphasis on investment in agriculture, mm-hmm. and it also resonated with me, um, Prime Minister, what you said, that civil society feels they're not part of what is happening in the country or in the city. And Something that that we find hopeful is the Feed the Future initiative out of the Obama administration that will be focusing on investment in, in rural agriculture. And a component of that is consultation with civil society. Um, but it seems to me there's, there's a lack of, of mechanisms in place or perhaps previous experience about how best to consult mm-hmm. with civil society in rural regions. And I would love to hear from both of you if you have any experience with this in recent history or any examples of how consultation in rural regions can work best in Haiti. Thanks very much. One more question on this side. Thank you very much, uh, Robert Nicholas with AME Seda. We've been working in Haiti for the last 24 years uh, north of Port-au-Prince in the Chendamateau region. I would like to ask uh, both speakers uh, who uh, Following up on your mentioning of the agricultural sector, first of all, why do you think there has been a lack of investment? And most importantly, where should we go from here with the agricultural sector? Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Please. Yes. Uh, Haitian economy is a rent-seeking economy. To give you a very very recent example, there was... um, a family who had a lot of 
uh, uh, import substitution um, enterprises, you know, and they close mm. these enterprises and they're renting the space because they are making much more money with Minusta <coughs> renting the space. So they are not producing anymore, whereas they were producing for and for the internal market. But but they, it's easier for them to make money, much more, renting the space. So the, the, the rent-seeking economy does not leave room for much investment. I wouldn't say that's why that that's the reason. That probably there are multiple reasons why there was there has been so little investment. In agriculture, and I, I would come back to the idea of that Bob also talked about the dichotomy of this country. You know, we, we have a, a very dichotomic society, culturally, economically, socially, and the peasants have always been left to their own devices, with very little support, very little education, very little roads, communication, and you talk about. Megan, Cheryl Mills, President, uh, Mrs. Clinton herself, when I was prime minister, that's when we started the discussion, when Mrs. Clinton decided that she wanted to refocus the foreign assistance in Haiti while refocusing USAID in general. And, and I told her, agriculture is extremely important, except that there also, you cannot think that by giving the peasants seeds and even tools that you're going to, to make a, a change. If you don't invest in the whole value chain in agriculture, just like Bob said, and all the other services that are around agriculture, if you don't install credit for small SMEs, credit is extremely, outrageously expensive in Haiti. And it's a big issue post-earthquake because most people who lost their houses built it in 25 years, 30 years out of their own salaries because they cannot get a mortgage so, and they have no insurance. So when the house is destroyed, they don't even know what they're going to do. And it's part of this little middle class also that is building. So to come back to agriculture, if you want to really make a difference there are lots of peasants' organizations in the country that have a lot of experience. Work with them on the whole value chain. Seeds, water irrigation when it's necessary, whatever the means, harvest, transformation, marketing. That also means electricity and roads. But if you keep on giving peasants seeds, forget it, it's not going to make any difference. So I think they heard what the discussion were, were, were useful because Mrs. Clinton sent three sets of experts in agriculture, in environment, in credit, in electricity. Well, the earthquake arrived, I don't know what's going to happen now, but it was very useful that we had this discussion on the value chain in agriculture. How do you want a Haitian peasant who cultivate rice in the Artibonite to compete with the farmer from Mix, Mississippi, from Biloxi, Mississippi, who is subsidized. It's impossible. So if you don't help him throughout the whole thing and make sure that there is an internal market for that, it's not going to work. Bob? Well, Michelle answers these questions with such thoroughness it leaves little for me to say. Um, but you've been looking I, at this for a long time. Well, <laughs> I, I would... have a passion for my country. You can feel it. <laughs> I would remind us of what we heard just a couple of weeks ago in this room about agriculture and this whole issue of the fact that Haiti has reduced its tariffs and uh, its agriculture is naked in the world market. That's right. it, it, it just has to compete with farmers who are subsidized elsewhere. And um, we were reminded at that meeting of, of, of former President Clinton's own uh, recognition of the fact that while he was in office, he helped the Arkansas farmers export rice to Haiti while destroying the Haitian rice um, industry. So I think part of the issue is certainly investing in Haitian farmers and, and learning from them and doing it throughout the chain. 
But I think some of that has to rest upon our own policies as well, that we can't continue to use Haiti and other places as kind of a source for our um, uh, exports surplus. surplus. Yes. Okay, thank you. We'll take two more questions, please. Hello, Madam Prime Minister. I'm Linda Delgado. I'm Director of Government Affairs with Oxfam America. We are, we've been in Haiti for many decades, as you know, and we are now thinking and looking at the next three years and in how we and our other, our NGO, many NGO partners can think differently and outside of the box um, as, as we sort of rebuild and rethink our work in Haiti. I'd like you to give us a grade, not Oxfam, but the NGO community generally. Are we coordinated or not? What's your sense of that? And two, do you sense that we're beginning to think outside of the box? Thank you. It's going Thanks. to be a fast answer. No uh, and no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Please, that Don't go ahead. Back, please. Hi, uh, Seamus Brennan. I'm with the Rule of Law program here at the U.S. Institute of Peace. Um, uh, returning briefly to the land and property issue and trying to tie it into the larger discussion, uh, we did a limited um, survey of some of the issues this spring, and one of the things that we, we really thought was pretty evident was not just the, the fact that titles were missing, but those that were present were of poor quality. They weren't current because it wasn't in people's interest to go and update with the courts when they divided it amongst their family and in the way that people actually used the land. Um, at the time, it appeared that the most promising initiative was uh, an, OA, an OAS mission to produce a new land cadaster in the long term. It's, I think it was a three-year timeline. And I was wondering if anyone had an update on, on the status of that. But also, to what extent does an initiative like that that ought to be only undertaken once displaces government function, or does it supplement because it is this sort of one-off? Very well. I have uh, a question from um, someone watching online who seems to David, who's with Quarles and Brady LLP, and he asks, are religious and charitable organizations required to coordinate their relief reconstruction efforts with any government agency? Hmm. So we have three kind of legalistic questions. Answer. Please, go ahead. Now, um, thank you for the question about the NGOs. It's a mess. <laughs> it's a mess. It really is. And there are so many categories. You know, there are the charitable, all the churches, all the sects. Well, again, and even within this category, there is, there is such disparity. And then there are the international NGOs. Then there are the national NGOs and foundations. Then there are the civil society organizations. It's extremely difficult. When I just arrive in office, President Preval told me, I don't know if you're going to be luckier than I am, but I'm trying to coordinate the international aid and the NGOs, and I'm giving up. Uh, I don't think I was luckier. We, were, we tried. But you see, some of them are the state in the state. And they have, a, they have more money than the ministries, in education, in health, and especially now after the earthquake, where there's been so much money raised, so many NGOs have more money than the ministries, considering also that the flow, <coughs> the, the pledges that were made are not substantiated with disbursements. So not much money is going to the government. Of course, there is the issue of corruption, but that's not just the case. The government needs to be reinforced. You see, the state needs to be reinforced. <coughs> And, and, and we need capacities, we need finan financial support, we need budget support. Even to tackle the NGO mess, we need to reinforce the institutions. I think it's going to take time, you know, but in, at the same time, it's important to see that some NGOs are doing great work, really. Some NGOs, they are, they are, subsidiaries of the government. They go to so many places where the government has no public service and sometimes I wonder what would happen if one day they just leave. People will be even in worse conditions in terms of providing education, health, sometimes even justice. 
you know, sometimes wards are being built with the support of NGOs. And now communication. Uh, so there's something has to be done there. And, and it's not yet in progress. And I don't think the earthquake, I think the earthquake <coughs> has, has shown how big, <coughs> even bigger is the problem. And there too, I think it's going to take time, and it's going to take a government that that has the le legitimacy and the leadership. Uh, and then the, the, the OAS, uh, yeah, yeah. That, that that's again. You see, when I was prime minister, I worked closely with the OAS even before the cadastre. Half Haitians don't have an identity card. So they are not legally existing. It's a big, big problem. I remember after the earthquake, IADB came to the government and offered us a cash transfer program that is very successful in Brazil and in Central America. But the first requirement is an ID card <coughs> because the money goes through the bank and it's through the ID card that they disperse to the women. It's a women program. So we were working along those lines because it's true that it has to be the first database. Even if you have cadastro and you don't have uh, identity, it's a problem. And there are peasants that, have, that are owners of their land, but they don't have an identity. So it, the OAS is working on both uh, issues. The, the, the identification, the civil registry, and the cadastre. Now, the, again, you see in Haiti there is something. <laughs> there is a, the, 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 the international donors came with something they call boot. So it's build, organize, uh, what's the other O? Uh, build, organize, I don't know, there is another O, and then the T is transfer. So in Haiti, we call it boo, because we never reach the T. <laughs> See? So each time they have to transfer that to the government, it's a big problem, because we don't have the money, we don't have the, the qualifications. And, and I'm afraid, even with this project, if from now the OAS is nothing, how are we going to transfer these capacities to the government and make it a state program, it's going to be an issue. Just, just to add one point, I, I think that, again, um, part of this problem with NGOs that you're describing has to do also, it also should be placed on the lap of the donors who yes. fund the NGOs, yes. particularly those who work under contract and, and uh, competitive bidding and so on. Because we've seen repeatedly that Donors select their NGOs to do their projects. That's right. And the government is marginalized or That's bypassed right. or brought in after <laughs> everything is already decided. And um, again, I, just to reinforce the point that I think the rhetoric is understanding this and the discussion is understanding it, but it needs to become an actionable yeah. um, program. And one, one last thing I would mention that um, one of the first things I learned when I went to Haiti in the 1970s um, I was asked by a wizened old priest if I knew the definition of a project in Haiti. And I said, well, how is it any different from any place else? He said, well, be careful. <laughs> he said, when people talk to you about a project, a project is defined as a way of getting money. Exactly. And, you know, once you get your money, then it's a success um, because the project is successful. So I think we have to be careful about also this idea of uh, what sometimes is called the projectitis. We look, have to look more at plans and strategies and programs and achieving results. Okay, we have 10 minutes left. Uh, we have five questioners. What I'd like to make you a deal. The deal is that each questioner gets five minutes. Each questioner gets one minute. One minute. We get five questions in, and then we give the, the, our panelists uh, five minutes to respond, and then we'll be over and leave on time. We so. Take them all? What? Do we take them all at, at once? Yeah, we can take them all at once, one after the other, and, and please be brief. So, you want to start? Sure. <coughs> Hi. Uh, good morning. My name is Jean-Michel Voltaire. I am an attorney with the Justice Department here in D.C. Um, <coughs> both of you spoke of the state is absent. That's a very dire metaphor to describe Haiti. 
I would assume that the governments have been absent, but the state is absent. It's very, very bad for the future of the country, if that's the case. Uh, <coughs> I think the government's been absent in the lives of the people because they most often focus on themselves instead of the well-being of the people. And in terms of the spirit of transcendency, we have to transcend the history that we have, the history of divisions and exclusions. Do you see any group or any particular person in the position to start the process, to begin the process of transcendence, the division that has been the culture of Haiti? Thank you. Well, you've set the standard. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Carl Henry Prophet, uh, representing myself. Uh, my question for Prime Minister Pierre Louis is, uh, you mentioned uh, the political culture in Haiti as a major impediment for progress. Um, you also mentioned uh, the need for transcendency. But on, the, on a more operational level, uh, from your experience, is there any concrete small step that could be taken in order to at least start to change this political culture? Okay. Thank you. Two. Three. Jan Duplain, International Correspondence Committee, National Press Club. Um, there is supposed to be an election November 28th. Is that happening? What about the candidates? Any predictions? I understand there's a woman that's leading. Thank you. Good. Very good. Okay, next. Uh, good morning. Daniel Petz from the Brookings Institution. Um, I have a couple of questions, uh, re uh, quick questions related to the land issue again, um, to the land appropriation uh, do you know if there is kind of uh, – are there any estimates how much compensations will have to be paid to the landowners? Uh, is uh, there kind of already a plan who is going to pay for this uh, compensation? Is there funding within the Haitian government or will some international donors uh, step in for that? And uh, uh, according to the master plan that doesn't exist yet, do you think there will ever be this master plan? Will it be still with the Preval government now or will we only see it with the new government after February? Thank you very much. Thank you. You're doing great. <laughs> Last but not least, uh, Carol Mates. I'm co-chair of the American Bar Association International Sections Haiti Task Force, and the ABA is an NGO, actually. Um, we um, have recently formed a task force. We have some lawyers that are interested in doing human rights work, and they've actually uh, liaised with some groups in Haiti. Uh, you, Prime Minister, you've identified certain other issues that seem to me uh, we have volunteer lawyers, American and non-American, who are interested in doing this work. And given what you say is the plethora of various organizations uh, and NGOs uh, tripping over each other, uh, I'd appreciate if you can tell us what is perhaps the best way that we could liaise with local groups to provide assistance on these commercial law issues land tenure, and land tenure, of course, is such a big social and uh, economic uh, area. And then secondly, the, um, the way to deal with some of these issues is registries. Mm -hmm. And registries mean you need investment in IT, technology, right. etc. cetera. Okay. Uh, we as lawyers can't do that. Is there funding available for that given the uh, more immediate needs of health, uh, sanitation, rebuilding, et cetera? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Carol. Uh, our questioners have stayed within the five-minute deadline, so we'll ask the panelists to stay within the five-minute response, and we'll all get out of here at noon. Thanks very much uh, to everyone who asked questions. Now, thank you. I'll try. To, I usually explain too much, but I'll try to be short. Uh, about the state being absent, well, it's a figure of speech. You know, this state is there. I mean, the state is. It's it's a way of saying that. Considering, on the one hand, what happened to the government, loss of infrastructure, loss of human resources, and the difficulty they were in to give any response, even to speak to the population. You know, it took the president a week before he said the first word to the population. And, and, and people could not believe it. <coughs> and when the president doesn't talk, nobody talks. He's the one that has the legitimacy so it's a figure of speech saying that considering the conditions before the, the earthquake and then the earthquake, the response has been extremely 
limited. That's my way of saying it. Now the government, the state is there, the government's response has been limited. Uh, who can begin the process of transcendence? I think again, there is someone who's talk about the women. I think the women can play a big role in the country. Big, big role. And then the university. Uh, I was at a symposium at MIT last week. There, was, there is one that ended in Haiti yesterday, headed by UMass, and there were 35 foreign universities there. I think there is a big momentum to rebuild <coughs> the Haitian university. And I pers I'm personally, uh, I'm involved in it. Because I can tell you the, the, the drive for learning that there is from the student community in Haiti. And, and the gatekeepers are usually not the students. So if we work hard at that level, something can spring out of there too. And there are other constituencies, you see. The problem is how to have that a converging movement that can have an impact and create some kind of critical mass. Um, the small steps or the political culture? I better watch it. Um, I think what I just said uh, covers <laughs> somehow. <laughs> if I have to be, <laughs> we'll let Bob answer. If I have, I have to like be it. short, <laughs> I have a tendency to talk too much. But um, y y yeah, I think there are lots of micro groups that needs to be federated and give a response at a higher level. Now the elections, that's an issue I don't want to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> it's October, no, November 28. I, I saw on the net, I don't, again I'm always cautious, that the president seems to have said to the Christian Science Monitor that mm. if the cholera epidemics, uh, how do you say that? Expand. Expand. Expands. Expands. Yeah. The, the, the election might have to be postponed, okay? Now, that's all I know. Now, there are 19 candidates. At least, I would say from my perspective, 12 of them come from the same political movement. So each one of them wants to be president. You know, it's exactly what happened to our people in Florida, you know? One of them could have been congressmen. There were five of them. And the five of them had more votes than the one that finally was nominated because they could not choose one. You see, so these are issues. That's why I don't like to talk about that <laughs> because there also there is a need of transcendence. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, we don't know what's going to come out, you know. It's, we don't know. It's, um, I, but I can say personally, none of them makes me say, wow. Land compensation. You see, the law in Haiti, when you expropriate, is very precise. There is a commission with the Ministry of Finance, the Tax Bureau, um, one or two other ministers, I don't remember exactly, but there is a commission that has to be formed, and the commission makes an evaluation of the land based on different parameters, the market price, the size, whatever. But it's all in the law. And then when there's this commission also has the expertise to see if the titles are legal or correct, and they, they, they propose a price for the compensation, an amount for the compensation. Now, the owner can refuse, but the government has the last word. And if the owner refuses, they just leave the, um, the, the, the check or mm. at the... Um, at the lawyer's office of the ministries of finance and economy. So there is a procedure for that. Now, who pays? Usually, not, when we're not in a situation like post-earthquake or a natural disaster, the government pays. The government puts that on their budget. I, I did that personally because I was part of an expropriation um, property when I was prime minister, and I budgeted for the amount because the Bureau of Tax told me this is how much we want to give those owners. You see, so, but now, since it's a lot of properties and a lot of land, I don't know if the donors are considering 
giving funding for that. I don't know at this stage. And the master plan, uh, there is none yet. There's going to be a new government theoretically in six months. I suppose the new government will have the difficult task of elaborating the plan, not just for Port-au-Prince, and again, Bob insisted on that, but I also insist on that. The future of Haiti is in decentralization. Um, the, the American Bar Association, you see there are lots of human rights organizations that you can connect with, you know. There is a civic movement that started in 2005 or six, during the transition uh, with the, the prime objective or the re, do you say re-foundation? No, you don't say that. The re-elaboration of the codes, the penal code, the, the uh, code d'instruction criminelle, yeah. yeah. you know, all the, all the, um, just judicial system codes. <coughs> and it was a very interesting movement uh, because it was participatory. They went all over the country to hear what people had as mm. grievances against the Haitian justice system. And they, they have a log, you know, of all those, uh, all those meetings. And it's very interesting to see if you could liaise with them. And they have a lot of information. Um, and of course, again, I think you can be helpful also in the civil registry, which is so important. When I was prime minister, the IADB gave me $10 million to start an experiment with the, with the civil registry. But I left office right at that moment. I think I covered as fast okay. as I could. Thank you very much. Oh, you did very well. Bob, you want to? Well, just, just very briefly, because again, Michelle just does a wonderful job in, in systematically knocking off the questions. Um, and it's a pleasure to hear her speak because, um, in a sense, it, it, it kind of revives a little bit this, a feeling of optimism that things in Haiti can change. Um, I, I, I think we, we need to be careful about the kind of the, the, the elixir or the silver bullet or this one particular individual who will, will lead the change. Um, and that's why, again, I like the idea of um, – of trying to work with women, trying to work with the university students. Um, there's there's a, um, a Creole proverb that says, an alphabet pa bet, that just because you can't read uh, doesn't mean you're stupid. So I think it's very important to bring those voices into the discourse, um, the, the, the peasants, the, the urban workers, and, and make sure that we listen to them and we seek out their advice and their, and their views. In terms of the election, um, I think it, it, it looks more that, that it's, it looks more or less that this may be an unprecedented election in Haiti, and that it may go to a second round. Yeah, there is no real wow factor, so there may be a runoff election, which would be scheduled in early January, I think mid January. Sixteen, and, seventeen. And and that would in, in uh, Haitian presidential politics that would be unprecedented since That's the new true. system of 1987. So. Anyway, thank you very much. I'd like to ask for a round of applause for our panel. Thank you.